Hi, I'm Kevin McCarthy, the Chief Technology Officer for Dover Motion. In this video, we're going to explore the design choices and trade-offs in automated microscopy with the goal of helping you to design an imaging system with the highest performance and throughput. But first, a little history on microscopes themselves. Lenses date back to about the 13th century. They were used at that time for both making things bigger, but also for correcting vision issues. And it wasn't really until another 400 years, in 1595, that the compound microscope was invented. And there's some dispute as to who actually did, but fortunately, they're both named Hans. The compound microscope consists of a sample, which we'll draw as an arrow here, and a objective lens, which is spaced a little more than one focal length away from the sample. And this creates a image at a further distance away. And the key invention was to add another lens here, the eyepiece lens, which allowed a human eyeball to view at high magnification the image, which itself was high magnification from the sample. Now, for most of the 400 years where we did have compound microscopes, they were all, of course, manual. We have an example of such a device here. The sample motion is manual by the human operator. The focus is manual, again, by the human operator. And the imaging is done with originally one and then later two eyes. And it was all human interpretation. These days, automated digital microscopes are at the heart of a vast array of modern biomedical, life science, and diagnostic instruments, from pathology scanners to DNA sequencers to cell imaging. On the left, we have an automated digital microscope that is currently focusing, going through focus, finding the best focus, and then snapping back to it, and moving field to field. The automated digital microscope consists of a programmable high-precision XY stage. Our DOF5 focus stage, that stands for Dover Objective Focuser, 5 millimeter stroke. So we're doing automated focusing, automated XY motion, and we have a CCD camera replacing the human eyeball. Now, the field of view of a microscope is typically very small. It can be a fraction of a millimeter to perhaps two millimeters. And the sample is much larger. This is the canonical sample for biological materials. It's a microscope slide that is 25 by 75 millimeters. And that's dramatically larger than the field of view. What we do is take many pictures of the sample across the X and Y space of the slide. There are larger sample formats. This is a microtiter plate, in this case, a 96 well. There are also 384 and 1536 well microtiter plates. This is a very large item, so if we're going to image much of it, we have to move perhaps a millimeter at a time, take a picture, and move on to image the entire sample. A third example of a large sample would be a flow cell. In this case, uh, this is used in DNA sequencing, and reagents enter and leave. It's heated and cooled. And over the course of that, that one lane there, there are 2,000 images in that lane, and there are eight of those lanes. So there's 16,000 images in this one flow cell. What we just described, we refer to as sequential field imaging. We take a picture, we move and stop, and take another picture and do this over and over again. There's another mode called TDI, constant velocity scanning imaging. And in this case, as you go along the long axis of your sample, you move at constant velocity. You'll then step over and do another swath. The motion, typically through a linear encoder, is used to trigger vertical transfers in a CCD camera so as to perfectly coordinate the imaging sensor with the motion. Now, it's important to point out that the compound, the eyepiece, obviously is not present in a digital imaging system. So this is not present. 
and the imaging sensor is placed at this image plane and the light from the sample goes up directly to the imager with only a single lens. It's usually a fairly complex lens. It's referred to as an objective. And here's an example of an objective. It's important to point out that there are two basic types of objective. The first would be a finite conjugate, and that's what we've drawn here. There is simply the objective which images the sample onto the sensor plane. But there's a bit of an issue with this because we want, for a variety of reasons, to introduce additional optical elements above the objective. And because the light is diverging, that makes it optically a little challenging. So in addition to a more traditional finite conjugate objective, there is the infinity corrected objective. In the case of an infinity corrected objective, we have our sample and we have our objective. And it by itself does not form an image. The light coming out of this from any given point on the sample is parallel. And so this will require one additional optical element, which is called a tube lens. It goes up about here, and the tube lens is what takes the parallel light from the objective and produces the image for the sensor. The advantage of an infinity corrected system is that you get to put additional optical elements in this area. And with parallel light, they don't produce the aberrations that would otherwise be the case with angled light. One of the optical systems that we might want to introduce into that infinity path is a laser autofocus system. And so this would be mounted about here and a beam splitter would go here. That beam splitter would reflect the 780 or 890 nanometer wavelength of the laser autofocus. That would go through the objective, focus onto the sample, reflect back up and come off into here. The beam splitter is a wavelength sensitive device, so it does not allow any of that laser light to reach the camera, but it does allow continuous feedback of the Z position to remain in focus at all times. Now the typical format for that signal is often analog, but we prefer digital step and direction and the DOF5 focus stage accepts step and direction so as to allow continuous high bandwidth focusing irrespective of sample motion or how flat the sample is. Another common optical element that is introduced into this area is a fluorescent filter cube. This fluorescent filter cube would go here. It consists of a beam splitter. Light would come in from this side through a excitation filter, be sent down, and when it hits the sample, the sample in many cases will fluoresce because we've labeled it or stained it with fluorophores, and redder light will come out, and when that light comes up, it transmits through the beam splitter, through this emission filter. This is emission, and this filter is excitation. So this would be perhaps green light going in, and orange or red light coming out. And that allows us to see fluorescent signals that are very valuable in both DNA sequencing and diagnostic applications. With this single fluorescent filter cube, you can see the presence or absence of a single fluorophore in the sample. But in many cases, you want to have a number of fluorescent probes. For example, in DNA sequencing, you'll want to have four for A, G, C, and T. To get these additional channels just requires a little more gear and an additional axis. This is an example of a four-channel fluorescent filter cube assembly where a stepping motor is being used as an inexpensive rotary indexer, bringing each of these into the optical path one at a time. In other cases, we use a linear mechanism. So this would be a single axis stage, linear motor or lead screw. And in this case, we have up to six channels of the dichroic, the excitation filter, and the emission filter. We can show you an example of fluorescence. We have some minerals. 
which when excited with an ultraviolet light will fluoresce red and green in the visible. So there's green willemite and red calcite with some green willemite. The excitation light is high energy, ultraviolet in this case. It hits the atoms, their electrons are excited to a higher energy state. And then when they decay back down, they don't make the jump all at once. They emit light, but they emit light that is redder. In this case, redder than ultraviolet, which is green and red. If we reduce the ambient light, the effect is even more pronounced. Green willemite and red calcite, each excited by ultraviolet wavelengths of 257 nanometers. In this video, we've covered some of the basics of automated microscopy, including a look at manual systems, the need for XY sample motion, as well as high precision focusing. We've also examined finite conjugate objectives versus infinity corrected, and looked at how the latter allows us to put valuable optical systems between the objective and the imaging sensor, such as an autofocus system or a fluorescent filter cube. At Dover Motion, we've designed high precision staging for automated microscopy and are ready to work with you to implement your imaging system. You can reach us on the web at dovermotion.com. We also have a white paper there, the XYZs of biomedical imaging, and feel free to reach out for your next application. In another video, we'll be exploring in detail calculations that involve magnification, field of view, numerical aperture, resolution, and depth of field.